Good morning. My name is Marissa Quinn. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs and University Relations here at Brown. Welcome. Welcome to the 250th anniversary of your institution. Thank you so much for coming and bringing the sunshine from wherever it is you came from, because we're very happy to have it gracing us here in Providence. You just never know. Uh, I'm a member of the committee that has been planning for the 250th for more than three years. And this was a weekend that we thought about from the very beginning as being critically important. And I hope you'll see that when you walk around the campus. There is literally something for everyone. And so I hope you'll take advantage of uh, the laboratory demonstrations, the art exhibits, the theater performances, musical performances, athletics, go to the Harvard game tonight. There's fireworks. Uh, and then, of course, there's panels like this. And the idea of these panels is to bring together alumni and faculty to explore issues that are of great importance to society and to Brown. Uh, this particular panel is focusing on the role of the media in both shaping and reflecting society. And this aligns very nicely with an area of our plan, Building on Distinction, which is a strategic plan for Brown. And that is, how do we think about how we use our scholarship, research, teaching, and service to create just, peaceful, and prosperous societies? So a person who's thinking a lot about this is political science professor Richard Locke. Rick is also the director of the Watson Institute for International Studies. And he is leading the conversation this morning, joined by two award-winning journalists, Mara Lyason, who is a national public radio political correspondent and Fox News contributor, and Mark Merrimont, the senior uh, editor of the Wall Street Journal. So they have tremendous, impressive bios. I don't want to go into that. I want to just get into the conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Marissa, and uh, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome uh, to this panel on the role of media in shaping and reflecting culture and society. And I also want to thank our two uh, panelists, uh, Mara Lyason and Mark Merrimont, for joining us uh, today. Uh, the panel is really going to focus on what role, what is the role of media and journalism in promoting a just and peaceful world, and how should we be preparing journalists uh, in the 21st uh, century. And so the way we're going to structure the panel is I have a couple questions that I thought I would sort of lead off um, and ask our panelists to address. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions, answers, and, and discussion. So let me uh, begin by asking uh, both uh, Mara and Mark if you could tell us a little bit about why you became journalists uh, and what, if anything, uh, that you experienced at Brown might have shaped that career uh, decision. Uh, and how has, that, how has your career in journalism evolved, given all the changes and the business model of uh, the media, social media, and things like that? So why don't we kick that off? And Mara, do you want to begin? Um, I was an American history major at Brown. And now I'm the national political correspondent for NPR. So I would say there's a straight line <laughs> from Brown to what I do now, with no deviations at all. Um, no. But I think that you know I, I do consider it a pretty straight line. Um, I was interested in politics and history. I've always been interested in politics and history. I was interested in social change. And um, I came here in the late 70s. And I had a wonderful experience here. You know, I would say my experience in the history department at Brown was just, you know, one of the best experiences of my life. Um, while I was at Brown, I didn't write for the Herald, actually, but I did write for something that no longer exists. It was a free weekly. I think it was called Fresh Fruit. So embarrassing. Um, but it was a magazine, a weekly magazine. So I wrote for that. And then I also was lucky enough to get. Um, a freelance writing assignment while I was here. Um, and I was able to work in the summers, certainly between my junior and senior year, I got an internship at the Vineyard Gazette on Martha's Vineyard. And then when I graduated, I worked for them year round. And I considered that to be um, you know, a complete and utter straight line. Just, you know, some of this I wrote about in a chapter in the Brown Reader, which I'm doing an event at the bookstore later this afternoon. So if you guys go to that, you're going to have to hear this thing twice. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, anyway, I wrote a history paper for Brown with uh, Jim Patterson. 
It was a psychohistory course, and um, like historical biography, that's what that translates to. And um, I, um, oh, let me back up. I'm forgetting the details of my own story. Um, the year before, when I took a course in early 20th century American radicals with John Thomas, who's now the late John Thomas, he was my advisor and my mentor and my all around hero. Um, to me, that was just what a kid comes to Brown and is in complete heaven when they look at the course catalog and they see early 20th century American radicals. Hey, this is me, late 20th century American radicals. Where do I sign up? You know. So it was a it was a class for upperclassmen. I talked my way in somehow as a sophomore, and that's my first class with John Thomas. And I wrote a paper for him about a group of artists in New York um, who painted very realistic um, pictures, they had a political agenda, and I submitted the, pa this is such a stupid long story, but I submitted the paper to a, a student essay contest in something called the American Art Review, which no longer exists. It got chosen, so my paper got published. That was very exciting, um, and I think I got $100. Um, and then, completely, Coincidentally and bizarrely, somebody, some art dealer from Boston read the article and wrote me a letter and said, you know, he wanted to hire me to write the, the text of an art catalog about somebody, he, an artist whose work he had purchased who also painted pictures of workers in factories. Okay. He was like a, oh God, like a, like a left-wing Norman Rockwell kind of um, <laughs> from Ohio. His name is Jared Benneker. In any event, this is just such a long, stupid story. He came to Brown. This could never happen today. He went to the registrar. He got information about where my dorm was. He went, he went to, up to the dorm room, knocked on the door. My roommate opened the door, and he said, hi, I'm a dealer. I'm looking for Mara. And she's like, <laughs> You know, freaked out, I wasn't there. Anyway, turns out this guy worked for the Vose Galleries in Boston. He had this, you know, complete collection of works by Jared Benneker, who was not a very great artist, but he did paint factory workers in Ohio, and he needed somebody who could work very cheaply, me, to write the catalog essay. So he hired me to do that, and he gave me $500, and I wrote that, pa the paper on Jared Benneker for the uh, psychohistory class, and then, Left um, Brown for a semester to kind of turn it into um, turn it into the text. Anyway, this is a this is a long story. While I was while I was doing that, I went to Martha's Vineyard for the for the second semester of the year because I could live in somebody's house who happened to be a famous writer whose daughter I met here at Brown. But in any event, I lived in their house. I wrote this catalog essay while I was there. I decided to apply to the Vineyard Gazette for an internship. I would go down there every week. I would kind of camp on their doorstep until they either had to hire me or call the police to get rid of me. And they hired me. So that's the long story. That was my first journalism job at the Vineyard Gazette. I've never, I, I've left journalism for maybe one year or two. I started very early in public radio. Um, I've been at NPR since 1985. I'm sure my story is very different from Mark's. I've had the same employer for almost 30 years. I have done different jobs for them. Um, NPR has been remarkably immune to the tumult that has occurred in the journalism industry. Um, we've been very lucky. We are a pretty, you know, we, we didn't have the same kind of implosion that print experienced. We also are cheaper to produce than television, so we didn't have there was no cable kind of that came into the radio world. Um, we do have, we did have the same financial problems as any big nonprofit organization, any university. You know, our endowment took a big hit in the financial crisis. But for the most part, we're still standing. We're moving into every platform you can, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. Um, and we've, we've actually benefited from the troubles of all of our sister, you know, publications and um, uh, television networks because we've been able to hire all these refugees, you know, people who lost their jobs and we have, we uh, were able to hire a lot of really great people in the last couple of years. But, you know, 
So it really was a straight line. I covered Congress for NPR. I was a general assignment reporter. I covered Congress for NPR. Then I covered Bill Clinton in the 92 election. Sometimes, not always, the person who, the journalist, the reporter who covers the winner gets to go to the White House as the White House correspondent. That happened to me. And I covered Clinton for eight years. Then I became the national political correspondent, which I am to this day. Only now I am back in the White House rotation. There are three of us. Every third week, I'm actually physically there. Um, I'm covering issues and ideas that I've always been interested in, that I've been interested in since I was at Brown. Um, you know, reform, social change, you know, how um, politics does or doesn't uh, come up with solutions to big problems. Um, you know, I, I, I really do think I've been doing the same thing for you know, since I was 18 years old. Great. <laughs> so. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mark, how about you? Uh, thanks very much, Rick. The, uh, it's funny because uh, listening to Mara talk about her history, uh, sort of history here at Brown uh, in the American History Department, I had the exact same professors, and they were incredibly great and inspiring. And, and uh, um, so, uh, but when I think back about why I got interested in journalism, it actually is actually all due to Brown, and uh, I know you think that's a paid announcement, but um, <laughs> we, uh, I did my history thesis on something that was actually 10 years old at the time, which was the Chicago 7 trial. And uh, so it was a little bit of a you know, heresy. Everybody was focused on you know, 1787 or whatever. And um, so, uh, uh, the, the thesis, uh, which they never thought I would finish, but I spent 20 hours a day in the library for the last month and, and finished it up, um, was well received. But one of the um, commenters put at the bottom a little note saying, this is very journalistic. And I thought, <laughs> oh no. <coughs> what kind of an insult is this? <laughs> so, uh, and, then, and then he wrote, um, have you considered becoming a journalist? A little light bulb goes off, like, you know. Uh, uh, so I actually went back uh, to my hometown, which is Chicago, for a couple of years and worked in a business uh, uh, sort of job, which was unbelievably boring. <laughs> and uh, so um, I started doing some freelancing for a local. I went into a local uh, free weekly. I don't, I'm not sure they even have these anymore, but they would, on each neighborhood in Chicago, the Lakeview Weekly or the Lincoln Park Weekly, they would throw them on your doorstep once a week. And I went in there and I talked to this crusty old guy. He says, what do you have that's written? I said, well, uh, I just did a 180-page thesis. <laughs> and he said, that's too long. I said, <laughs> I said, what about a chapter? So I carefully Xeroxed, you know, in those days, a chapter. And I dropped it off and, and about I called them, never hear anything. And then I went by there like two weeks later, and I knocked on the door again. You know, it's smoke-filled room and the whole thing. And I said, uh, "Did you have a chance to read that? Too long." <laughs> he said, "What ideas do you have for me?" So I gave him three ideas, and he said, "Okay, those all sound good. Do them." So I got it was uh, I got paid twenty-five dollars for my first article, and uh, you know, it, it was just like a big buzz. And it's, you know, I just got very uh, jazzed about the whole thing. I came of age in the Watergate post, sort of post Watergate era, and um, you know, everybody. I think I went to journalism school at Columbia after this, and everybody I met there uh, wanted to be Woodward in Bernstein. So, uh, uh, and, and actually, some of them have been, become incredibly famous uh, journalists, um, and it was an incredibly talented class. But I wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein too. So, guess what? I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but I have had a very uh, wonderful career. I worked at Business Week magazine for many years. Uh, I was in posted in London. Did some stuff in Europe, and then uh, I've been at the Wall Street Journal for quite a long time. And what really still jazzes me, uh, I've been an editor and also a reporter, and I actually am back reporting a lot now. And um, I just get really excited about finding new things out that people do that's bad, particularly that, that are bad. I mean, I just, it's like, uh, I'm like a detective. And um, so you know, there's nothing, and I spent a lot of time recently doing kind of data journalism, like you find things in big data. We talk about the changes in the world now. 
And there's been a huge change in uh, the media industry, of course, as we all know, because of technology. Um, but it also has presented all kinds of opportunities for people who say, you know, there's a change, but there's also like great tools out there that we can use. So um, just, you know, mining data for interesting trends or stories. A couple of years ago, I did a story about um, using jet aircraft, private jet aircraft flights. And uh, so you can, believe it or not, the FAA you know, has a database of every flight in America going back over many years. And I discovered there was another database of golf scores where people would post their own golf scores. So we did a, like match them up. The story about the CEO flying on the company jet to go to Naples and then he'd post his golf score for the weekend and fly back. $70,000 with a jet flight. So this is, you know, it's like you couldn't have gotten this before the technology era. So, you know, we try to adapt, we try to change. Uh, I still have a great time, it's fun, and, um, you know, looking forward to talking a lot more about journalism and the media. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Let's, uh, I have a couple more questions and then we'll open it up. And let's uh, go back to you, Mark, about um, sort of the different roles that journalists play, right? So you play a role of watchdog and some of your articles about executive compensation, a variety of other things, has, have done things like that, um, of educating the public and a variety of things, and especially um, in the print media space, but not only the print media space, there have been so many challenges and changes in that sector. How have those roles uh, evolved or been challenged, uh, given all the changes in your, in your line of, of work? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that, that the print media has been incredibly challenged. I just have a question of everyone here. How many people today uh, have a daily newspaper delivered to the door. So this is, I got, I got a lot of a selection bias. Well, now it's actually interesting because, you know, a lot of us are uh, approaching middle age and, uh, uh, and uh, but I think. Wait, ask it a different way. How many people here who are under 30 have a newspaper delivered? Well, there's nobody here under 30. I was, I was at my daughter's college in, in Colorado and I asked the same question, um, you know, and obviously just like where do you get your news and in college students all get their news online and I do too. I actually, we, I have three daily newspapers but I'm in the business so, um, but it's uh, obviously changed a lot and we've had, you know, I have to say it's one of the sort of most depressing things is we've just been through cutback after cutback after cutback and the benefits are shrinking and it's, you know, it's been a little disheartening from time to time. I mean, uh, we had some new ownership changes, as you know, and it's actually stabilized the situation um, from a financial standpoint. But, you know, I do think that journalists have, uh, the sort of watchdog role has diminished uh, to some extent. We just don't have the resources we used to have, even at the Wall Street Journal. And a lot, there are very few newspapers in the country that do now. New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and you know a few others still do excellent kind of investigative watchdog group and NPR and and um, but it's um, it's shrinking and shrinking, and you know I am concerned about that because I think that uh, there's a lot of commentary and great stuff on the internet, but a lot of it is kind of reflecting what I would call, a, it's like a pyramid with a small base of original reporting at the bottom, and then uh, you know a lot of chatter at the top. And uh, the question is, if you shrink the base further and further, the chatter sort of becomes uh, more and more um, diffuse and not as, as good. I mean, it's, you know, there's been a lot of good citizen journalism and interesting things that are going on that are changing the environment, but uh, another thing that I'm a little concerned about, um, and I can see in our own work, and sometimes in a weird ways, is the rise of basically partisan journalism, which, um, which you know, I mean, I grew up, and as we talked about the Woodward and Bernstein era, and I was taught, you know, almost injected into our veins at journalism school, like you're supposed to be completely, you know, impartial, which is basically impossible because we're all human beings as reporters, but. Um, but in addition to putting pressure on people, uh, and the journal actually has been pretty immune from this, uh, even under the new ownership, but the, on the news pages, but the, um, uh, 
one of the issues is that people out there perceive everything we do in a, in a partisan way. Like they think that we're writing partisan things. We have kind of a, like a joke uh, on the online WSJ.com. We bet how long before an unrelated story will be attacked by, on a, by a commenter used as a political thing. So I did a story about how, a, a series of stories about how Google and other tech companies are not um, giving free food out to all their employees, like lavish buffets, but there's no taxes being charged. All right. Yeah, and um, so uh, we had a little bet going internally, which I won. By the third comment, it was all about the IRS and you know partisan attacks on Republicans. But this was about a 1950s era IRS regulation. Uh, and if they did take on Google, it would have been taking on a Democratic leaning, you know, Silicon Valley type thing. I mean, people will just read anything into, you know, sort of benign stories these days. And I find that disturbing. Uh, I mean, you know, we get very cynical about it, but it's, it is, um, I think, sort of undermining the fabric of our, of our um, society and political uh, and eco even economic or social discourse. So great. Thanks. And Mara, even though uh, NPR didn't have the same kinds of challenges as, say, print uh, media, but in terms of the proliferation of these kind of very partisan blogs, all this chatter, and every now and then actual political um, attacks on the funding of NPR. Oh, every now um, and then. <laughs> uh, or maybe continuous. Um, and I just wonder, how, how do you feel uh, these different roles that journalists play well, have been affected? Well, first of all, there's no doubt that the environment, the media environment, is hyperpartisan, like every other part of politics today. And what do they say? Fox and MSNBC don't even cover the same natural disasters. Um, it's like people live in completely separate universes. And, you know, we could talk about partisanship for like 12 hours here. And, you know, it's, it's permeated every aspect of American life, including people. I mean, people now live with people that agree with them. They work with people that agree with them. People are, you know, the, the country's more partisan. However, as somebody who appears on Fox and NPR, and believe me, I get grief from both audiences for different reasons, and I believe I say exactly the same things on both um, places. NPR is my regular job, and then I go to Fox once or twice a week to be on a panel of journalists. Um, uh, it really is true that people live in different universes, and I think it's really too bad. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I really don't. I mean, NPR strives to be down the middle, objective. There's no doubt that our audience is more you know, liberal than the audience at Fox. Um, and <coughs> there are people who perceive NPR as left. I mean, it's just all I think that I can do, and, and don't forget, I'm a lowly content provider. I'm not like an editor. I don't make <laughs> decisions. I just, you know, provide content, and all I can do is, is do my best, and like Mark said, I'm a human being, of course I have opinions, but to be as balanced as I can, to make sure there are voices from both sides in every story, um, that doesn't mean you can't come to a conclusion, um, or, or make some kind of pointed analysis. But, um, you know, what he's talking about, the inverted pyramid, sometimes we call it the echo chamber. I mean, where there are all the people up there commenting and bloviating and, 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 you know, the punditocracy. There is a kind of self-perpetuating um, Tower of Babel kind of aspect to it. But I, one thing that I did want to ask Mark is I understand that resources are diminished and that's just across the board and it's a tragedy. I mean, you turn on local news. I don't know if there, you know, so few local stations, even local NPR stations have the money to do real good investigative journalism. However, it seems that at a time when the barriers to entry are so low to being a journalist, all you need is a laptop, and I would think that big data is also relatively accessible. Um, how come the resources, the diminishment of the resources is such a big obstacle? In other words, it seems like we live at a time when some of it should, journalism, good journalism should be easier to do in some ways, yeah. not more expensive. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, there is a lot of, um, I, I have seen and uh, have been the beneficiary of a lot of what I would call good citizen journalism. Um, 
you know, people who do stuff on their own and they gather some interesting material, but they don't know what to do with it and nobody listens to them. So then they might contact me or somebody else in the journal and say, look, I've gathered this really interesting information. Some of them have filed elaborate Freedom of Information Act requests and, you know, done all sorts of interesting things and, you know, they just don't have a big enough voice yet. You know, there are people who are gathering a big enough voice and are doing, you know, very good journalistic-like stuff. Like the Glenn Greenwalds of the world. Yeah, and, and, you know, know, there's a lot of, um, but one of the things that we try to offer people is what we call curated journalism, which is that somebody besides me, there's a filter between me and, you know, you, uh, which is probably usually a good thing. I don't always agree, but uh, in, in the case of the Wall Street Journal, there's usually at least a couple of editors who look something over and a lawyer and, you know, <laughs> another lawyer and, you know, so uh, um, some of my best friends are lawyers. Um, but uh, so the people, when they see the content of the journal, they know it's been thought about and, and you know, carefully cultivated. And we, you know, I think that adds to a little bit of, um, hopefully a little bit of imprimatur to our, or an imprimatur to our copy. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just gets around. I mean, look at this um, TMZ video of, uh, Oh, it's unbelievable. You know, yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of different media operations or the 47% you know, uh, video or audio that, um, video I guess it was, that I think had a very large role in, in And that was, that was Mother Ron Jones, I mean, being, that's, a true, yeah. that's an established publication. Yeah, but I, somebody, yeah. somebody. Yes, yes, somebody had to get it. Right, right, exactly, so it's, you know, it's like, why would you even do that if you weren't thinking about <laughs> citizen journalism of a different sort? Uh, so, you know, it's been, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, things are, uh, it's expensive to do good journalism. We have uh, three or four like really, really good data people that we now work with who are, you know, just sit there all day long crunching numbers and comparing spreadsheets and, you know, mining stuff for really interesting stories. But th these people are not cheap and, you know, um, and it's not easy to, you know, to keep them employed. So. Great. Why don't we open it up to uh, the uh, the audience and people ask questions and if when you ask, just identify yourself uh, briefly. Sure. I'm John Evans, you're a class of eight for uh, teaching journalism at GW a little bit. Um, more, more, more for you, um, Silicon Valley, um, what role are we going to see from some of the folks who have been successful in tech who are now venturing into journalism? What do we anticipate um, given that you're kind of in both worlds? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's sort of a joke among um, journalists these days, uh, which is uh, choose your billionaire carefully. <laughs> like, who, do, who do you want to work for? Is it Pierre Omidyar? Uh, is it um, Rupert Murdoch? You know, uh, is it um, Michael Bloomberg? Uh, yeah, I mean, lots of, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, just there's there's... Lots of people, and you know, it's. I think it's good that um, wealthy, influential people want to see the value of influencing opinion through media. So that's a positive, and these people obviously have the resources to uh, sustain a Washington Post or uh, or a new venture of some type. But you know, obviously, a lot of them bring. Um, opinions or biases or whatever you have uh, to the party and you just have to decide whether you as a journalist want to live with that or not. So, um, uh, I mean, I, you know, it's just, uh, I'm not sure it's just Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley has obviously minted a lot of new people uh, with a lot of money, but it's just, you know, a lot of folks out there who want to play in this exciting space. It's sort of, you know, it's like a expensive toy. It's like a baseball. I mean, look, Steve Ballmer but spent $2 billion on the Dodgers, you know? Uh, so. Okay. We have but, you know, I just, I just want to say sure. something about that. You know, rich people have always bought, you know, publications. But, you know, and there's a difference between a Rupert Murdoch, who's an old-fashioned press baron, and what you're asking about, which is 
And, and I, I would only say the answer to your question is like TBD because so far, Jeff Bezos, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen anything. He's owned the post. Like we were waiting for some incredibly interesting thing to happen because he comes out of this world of tech. So far, it hasn't happened. So I would just say, or it's TBA, not TBD. Um, but anyway, whatever it is, it just, we don't know yet because they haven't, and, and I don't think the Ahmed Yar, what's the name of his? First look. First look at yeah. yeah, I don't really. It hasn't happened yeah, yet. Yeah, so I think it's just to be continued. Great. Well, yeah. But one more thing, I, and I probably didn't really address your question, uh, the underlying question, which is can technology be used to, um, to you know, further the media? I, I sure as hell hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, um, you know, we're trying hard. We do a lot of multimedia at the journal. There's a lot of video. We do, um, we have this sort of web several times a day um, uh, and um, but I think that traditional media people are just not as swift at it as people from Sil the Silicon Valley culture and I'm hoping that some cross fertilization can take place where we are still allowed to tell stories still allowed to do investigations but you know and have the funding for it which is the key thing and people will see it so you know as, as Mara said stay tuned great other questions? I thought I saw. Yeah. I realize that at least according to Charlotte Andrews, 78, I realize that at least according to the Supreme Court, uh, corporations are people now. But um, what do you think about the role of corporate advertising and what does or doesn't get a lot of play in the media today? Well, I mean, th the question is about corporate advertising. I mean, NPR does not have sponsored content, okay? So, I mean, I, I can't. I like you guys. Well, okay. But we do have underwriters, which are advertisers, translation. And I think it's pretty clear when we have an underwriting credit on NPR. I mean, and I hope it continues to be. Um, and that, to me, is the big important thing. I mean, there's always been advertisers in the media. And there, there has to be, because otherwise, uh, then we are going to be dependent on the federal government forever and ever. And I can, I can make a prediction that NPR at some point in the near future will have no federal funding. And I'm fine with that, absolutely fine with that, uh, personally. I'm not speaking for NPR. Um, but as long as it's delineated as corporate advertising and not something else, I think that's okay. But there is this whole new, new world now of sponsored content, which I can't really speak to. But yeah, well, I mean, we don't have it, but the... Um, I mean, the real issue is the economics of the media business, which is, you know, for years it was, we would get, well, sell you a Wall Street Journal subscription for, you know, $200 a year, which is very little for somebody to print up the newspaper and go around and throw it on your front doorstep or bring it to your building or whatever. Um, and then most of the money came from advertising. I mean, there was, back in the 99 period, we literally could not print enough newspapers, hard to believe. Um, so they had to like close sections early so we could print new newspapers. Of course, you know we'd love for those days to come back, uh, come by in another section. But the, um, you know, now the advertising has shrunk dramatically. So the question is, who's going to pay for this? If, you know, and the New York Times and we and others have, have these paywall um, type things where people are paying, but it's not nearly enough, really, frankly. So there's hopefully going to be a balance struck and. I think we're still striking at the journal, but there are other places that are starting to move and that, you know, a little more blurred of let's have the advertisers, but also let's keep some, you know, a pretty strict line between um, what we call church and state. I'm not sure who the church is, but um, so the, uh, you know, but it's uh, a lot of economic pressures on the business, and when people are under pressure and they have profits to produce, then they'll make compromises, unfortunately, so. Great. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Jeff Anderson, class of 84. Um, is there any concern about the, the youngest generations and how they're getting news? I think most of us here probably sat down with our parents and watched the nightly news. Uh, you know, we delivered newspapers, so it was part of our lives. But now, you know, kids are trying to do things just on Instagram or whatever and, and looking at 142 characters. And they don't have that same sort of intro of news like we do. It's TMZ and YouTube, and, and not the real stuff. That, that so, what well, thoughts about that? my thoughts are I'm scared to death. <laughs> I mean, really, I think that you know, 
just an uninformed public is a really scary, an uninformed generation is a really scary thing. And sure, they know everything about Miley Cyrus, at least my kids do, you know, but it scares me to death. I mean, I don't know what the answer is to that. I really don't. But um, I can tell you just having interns at NPR who come from excellent colleges and are supposedly highly educated, when they are typing up my interviews, just transcribing them, you know, and they come across the name of an elected official, like a prominent elected official, and they have no idea how to spell that person's name because they've never, obviously, they have no idea who, the, who he is, Senator so-and-so, you know, whatever. Anyway, it's, I'm, I can't help you on that one. I'm scared to death. <laughs> I'm totally depressed. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Sure. Could you introduce? I would have agreed with you a few years ago, but I have to say my two sons, ages 22 and about to be 20, they read, they don't read newspapers in print. They read everything on the internet, and I mean everything. So they do know all about my, my Cyrus or the foot, you know, cars or whatever. But they also know a huge amount what's go, about what's going on in Ukraine or in Gaza. Or I mean, now they're both political science types, but they read. They oh, that's read great. So that's, that's really great. great. And they, they tell me at least that all their friends do. So I don't know whether that's really, whether there's really as much to be concerned about as we newspaper readers like to think. I just don't know. OK, let's bring you, yes. <coughs> yeah, hi, I'm a, a reporter with the Brown Online Magazine. So it seems to me that we're talking about this new period as new and unprecedented. But it does seem to me we're just going back to the way the media was, the pre-Watergate era, the way it was in your, the way it is in Europe, even still, where community, gossip, rumor, and partisan papers all come together to produce the civic fabric of the United States. So is it just that maybe Watergate, that error, that when you, was just a blip, and we're really just going back to the normal state of journalism? No, I mean, if you think back to, I mean, I lived in the UK for quite a while, and, and the papers were much more aligned in and I think still are with political parties than, you know, American newspapers supposedly are. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was, and Parliament was, of course, a little bit more raucous than the Senate used to be. Um, but the, uh, um, but as you say, this, the civic society, you know, got along well. I think that the, you know, there is some view in the journalism world that that was kind of a golden era. The, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, uh, and now it's changing a lot. Uh, the, you know, I'm not sure that we're going back so much as to, uh, you know, unknown future where we don't know how well these things are, you know, uh, what's going to happen to to society. The uh, I'm actually, you know, a little bit more optimistic than Mara is because I think people, um, there's been a lot of technological changes over the last several thousand years, but people adapt. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can adapt to the 140 character era, which, by the way, journalists love because we can, like, tweet our latest accomplishment or our friend's accomplishment out, and then, you know, 200 other people tweet it, retweet it, et cetera. It's like a huge megaphone. So it's uh, all the people I know, it's basically like self promotion uh, as opposed to anything else. So. But it's, um, uh, but, you know, I, I agree that we are changing in some ways back to something that was, you know, back to Thomas Paine and, you know, the various founders and, you know, they had a completely different view of what journalism was back then, too. Um, but it's, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same as it was in 17, you know, 80s, so. Mara, do you want to add to that? Or? Um, yeah, I, I think we're entering a brave new world. I mean, nobody's figured out the business model, you know, how you make money on something that's basically free. Um, and I would say in terms of what, what we do at NPR uh, with, with social media, it's definitely a promotion tool. You know, it's to get people to link to our stories, to come to our website. Um, and, uh, but it's really important. Um, and also, we have a little bit difference. We, we, you know, we're listener supported, and we do have corporate advertising, but we also have listener, you know, listeners who who support us. But um, 
you know, I, I said this earlier, you know, NPR is this remarkably stable, I don't want to say we're not changing like crazy like everybody else is, but we're a remarkably stable island in this roiling sea of journalism. But I don't think the future has been figured out yet. Um, I don't know what it means to get your news in 140 characters. I know what it means to be told about a story that Mark or I have written and then linked to it. That I get. But, you know, to get your news, you know, from your Twitter feed and that's it, I don't really know what that means. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Scott T. 83. Um, assuming you agree with the premise of my question, um, to what do you attribute the incredible decline in television journalism where, you know, I grew up watching Walter Cronkite, who uh, allegedly his own family didn't know what his political persuasion was, to Fox News, where you got to turn your head way to the right, yeah, with all due respect, and, uh, and, and, and others would argue that MSNBC, you got to turn way to the left. You know, both in terms of the selection of what they cover and in terms of God, I mean, unabashed bashing of the president in the case of Fox, I mean, to the point of sport. So uh, to what do you attribute to that, and where, what do you see as the end game? Uh, it, should one be very pessimistic? Because there's big money in opinion as opposed to news. There's also big money in this idea of narrow casting. I mean, and you know, Roger Ailes figured this out, that there was this incredible audience for a, for a conservative newscast, news channel, that hadn't been tapped. MSNBC found the same thing. You know, I, we talked a little bit about this earlier. This is not something, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, and it's not something that a few nefarious people in the press invented. This is what's happening in society. I mean, people, you know, listen to news outlets that they agree with. To me, like, why bother, you know? Um, I always tell when I talk to groups of students, I say, look, you know, it's really important that you listen to stuff and read stuff that you don't agree with. And, you know, go to a news aggregator. You know, there's some great websites that are news aggregators. Uh, Real Clear Politics, there are a bunch of them that have everything that's been written on a certain subject from all, and you can link to all the different outlets. Um, I, I think that, you know, society, because of technology, um, has become more atomized and more, you know, uh, what is it? Um, you can kind of create your own, it's the selfie culture. You know, you can create your own news feed, uh, just of things you want. One thing that, the reason I still read newspapers, oh, not just because I am old, but um, I, you know, when I go on the website of, uh, of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and then I look at the paper, there's something that I missed. If you can't flip through it, it's not, you know, I just feel like I'm not getting everything. I, I don't know why, because obviously everything should be on the website, but it's not. It's hard to find, yeah. yeah. I don't know why, but it is. Yeah. Uh, Great. Yes. Um, so you said if you could just introduce yourself, oh, please. Anastasia Rivas, 81. Um, what do you tell students who want to go into journalism? And could you please be very honest? If it were a family member, <laughs> Stop! No. <laughs> That's a question I always ask yeah. the doctor. Like, if you were treating your daughter, you know, <laughs> what would you say? So, and they usually lie. But um, the, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of torn. I think that um, for people who really like to tell stories or, you know, uh, interested in this sort of career, I mean, first of all, the one thing I would say is that it sort of depends upon your personality. If you're a doer, someone who likes to do things, then maybe it's not for you. If you're a observer, uh, you know, uh, then it, you know, it's something to consider. I, you know, it's funny because I think that um, there are people uh, approaching middle age like me uh, who are, um, you know, toward the sort of latter stages of our career and we've got enough seniority that we can sort of last out the technological changes. <laughs> and then there's young people who are now coming in and we, have, we actually hire a lot of them at the journal who have tremendous uh, skills with multimedia and with, um, uh, they can, you know, some of them can code things on the internet and they have very good with social media and they can you know, do six screens at once and whatever. They seem to be doing fine too. It's the people who are in their 30s and 40s that I'm a little more concerned about who you know, um, 
a little more expensive, you know, than the young hires and maybe don't have the skill set. And a lot of these people are, you know, learning up quickly. But it's, you know, I think young people, there's going to be, if you're adaptable and you can, you know, sort of manage your, you know, brand you in your career, then uh, it's, it, it can be a viable career. I'm not sure that I would, one last thing. The one thing I would be a little concerned about is, um, I'm making a decent income at the Wall Street Journal now, but I think it's very difficult to be like a main bread provider for a uh, you know a, a decent family in the journalism business, unless you really are a superstar. Uh, so you know this it's becoming to some extent um, uh, I hate to say this a pink collar profession. And uh, at Columbia Journalism School, which I graduated at, there's far more uh, women going into the journalism than there are men. Um, and, you know, take that as it will. But it's, uh, it's definitely changing. The economics are changing, like, who wants to go into it, too? That's really something to think about. When all of the most important professions in a society, starting with teaching and journalism, become pink collar, why? Because they don't pay that much. That's really something to chew on. I mean, absolutely. And medicine will be that way too, I predict. Medicine will be that way. All of the most important things will become, you know, places for people who don't have to be the sole breadwinner. I mean, that is really bad. But anyway. Great. Yes. This is the last question. Go ahead. Yeah. Eleanor Blackrock, 65. Um, well, I wonder, for those of you who are in uh, reasonably objective media and therefore want to cover, supposed to cover at least two sides of the issue, but how do you handle these issues where one side is just wrong? I mean, <laughs> You can do that. You mean one side is wrong on the facts? Like, like if birthers one's, or yeah, like birthers. I mean, there there is actually objective truth. There's also opinion, and there are there there are on on almost every policy debate there are two sides. That's different if you're arguing about a fact. Was the president born in the United States or not? That's you can say that people are wrong. That's different than saying. Um, you know, that's different than saying somebody who believes in some kind of a policy solution, you know, is wrong. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I agree with that. I think there's a tremendous um, problem that we're having, and we have it, unfortunately, at our paper, and I see it in the New York Times, which I read regularly, um, which is this, what I call false equivalence. You say, you know. Yeah. On the one hand, you know, the earth is round. And on, on the, the other hand, hand some people think yeah. it's flat. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like just as, and they often are given almost as much ink as the, um, as the main uh, sort of things. And, and it, it happens in more subtle ways at a, in a lot. But it's, there's just a lot of pressure toward false equivalence as opposed to we've spent six weeks reporting and researching this. We've talked to all the various parties. You know, we've come to our sort of approach. Yes, we're going to tell you that there are alternate, you know, uh, theories about this, but this is what 85% of the article is going to be about. And, uh, but not all the editors of my paper agree with me. So. I mean, climate change is, you know, the biggest example. Great. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our uh, time for this session. Uh, please join me in thanking. Thanking them for uh, helping to promote a uh, peaceful, just, and prosperous society through their work. Thank you. <laughs> what are you doing? To